Well, I'm delighted to be here to share some views and uh, hopefully learn from you as well concerning um, the upcoming uh, 5G network um, scenarios. Um, we have gone through a whole set of generations of wireless, and we're seeing that 5G is going to be a fundamental paradigm shift in terms of how um, the uh, operators and the uh, uh, customers will be dealing with 5G. Uh, so this talk is about uh, some major issues still to be resolved for 5G. Uh, 5G per se uh, has got a whole set of documents, uh, especially on the 3GPP side. Um, the ones I have wanted to highlight today are what specific action need to be taken to make it workable for the applications um, that it is, it is targeted towards. Um, so... So the uh, overall structure of the talk is we'll start with introduction to 5G. Uh, as I said, I'll only highlight a few things about it. Then um, the key area where there is consider considerable concern uh, continues to be is in the operation in the millimeter wave spectrum. Um, as you know, millimeter wave is in the uh, 30 to 300 gigahertz, uh, which corresponds to the wavelength of 10 millimeter down to one millimeter, and the 5G uh, is operating in major part of that uh, spectrum, which none of the cellular systems have operated so far. Um, the major issues that we will touch upon today are the propagation and coverage. And as you would expect, when you change the basic uh, spectrum domain into a higher and higher frequency, the um, path loss and all other types of negative um, connotations relating to um, the, uh, the uh, distance uh, come into the fore, so we have to take specific actions. Not that these are something new that we have not come up with. In fact, things like MIMO and others are defined as part of earlier generations, but they have not been uh, critical and as imperative as they are for 5G, and we will walk through that. And then biological impact is something new because all the current um, systems have worked in the sub-6 gigahertz range, whether you're talking about uh, the 3GPP standards um, all the way to 4G or Wi-Fi or WiMAX or all the other uh, lower-level, um, you know, um, uh, area networks, proximity area networks and so on, like Bluetooth and all, which all work in either ISM band at least below 6 gigahertz. And then we'll come up with some conclusions in terms of uh, uh, what steps we need to take. This is the summary of the evolution uh, going all the way from the 1G, 2G to the 3G, 4G, and what differentiates 5G from the earlier versions. Um, basically, starting from the left, uh, you have the, what is commonly called as a feature phone, and the 1G and 2G, as you know, were, um, uh, were targeted towards voice. Uh, the 1G was that big brick uh, you know, a handset that you might be aware of, which uh, for which the battery lasted maybe a couple of hours. It was only useful for car uh, mobility, uh, but it was without that we wouldn't get the next one. So 1G was a basic uh, uh, analog type of voice network. Then 2G became the key one in terms of providing uh, enhanced voice, digital voice. And you may recollect there were basically three standards. One was a CDMA in, uh, um, and TDMA in U.S., uh, the two standards. And then uh, GSM, which is nothing but the TDMA, was introduced by Europe uh, as a um, um, uh, TDMA standard. Uh, over time, clearly, uh, TDM, U.S. TDMA you know, sort of died down because the real uh, energy and the backup, uh, although... It was not as efficient as the U.S. CDMA was the 3GPP. They had much more cloud around the world. So GSM became the comparatively maybe 70, 80 percent of the uh, of the networks around the world and uh, possibly in, in U.S. and South uh, Korea and uh, and uh, Puerto Rico were the ones which supported the CDMA, the U.S. CDMA standard. So the whole focus on um, 1G, 2G was voice. Um, and at the same time, you can sort of see that the wireline uh, communication uh, was roughly a decade ahead 
in this sense, as we move forward, especially for data transmission as compared to the wireless. So the internet was primarily uh, introduced on the uh, coaxial and the copper network, uh, DSL, as well as uh, all the uh, um, cable uh, data in the 90s. And then when we came, come to the two, 2000s and 2010s, the migration for wireless, and that is the focus of today's talk, was towards uh, data and then finally to, in 4G towards video. So it's like the sequence of what type of traffic we need to support which determine the generations. 3G in normal parlance was called internet on wireless. The idea was to what was provided in the wireline in the 90s became the requirement for 3G. So 3G clearly supported voice, plus it supported data, um, and uh, still in the range of uh, 384 to 1 megabit kind of a data. Uh, and that is that gave rise to the new concept of the smartphone. And then, of course, you all know the, the subsequent tremendous growth of a smartphone as a required uh, user device for most of the customers. So we had the data, and uh, the basic structure changed somewhat. Uh, in addition to the first uh, generation, second generation, which had a voice code, <coughs> um, uh, MSC, the uh, um, Mobile Switching uh, Center, uh, 3G and 4G introduced a core for the data part of it. So that was called the uh, uh, Enhanced Packet Core, and then SGS and GGSN was part of the uh, 2G, 3G. 2G, sometimes the data part of it is commonly called the GPRS or the edge. Uh, that becomes a 3G data in 3G, in 3G. 3G then introduced CDMA. All, everything was in CDMA. Uh, it had a standard structure up the line. Uh, we had more of the routers rather than just the uh, MSC and the uh, feature phone side. And then cloud was not inherent part of the network as much as it started coming into the application domain. People started using that for uh, you know, uh, storage and pro processing as a service, et cetera. So that was uh, 3G, 4G. Um, then we come to the 5G. 5G, the standards are still being finalized. It will be in the 2020s. Uh, and what it did was a fundamental shift, not only in terms of the support for voice, data, and video, but added machine type communication. So that's where the IoT comes into the picture. So for IoT, uh, 5G added the capabilities of uh, uh, handling machine type communication. Uh, and the other fundamental shift in terms of the network itself was use of the cloud, um, not just for the application development, but also for management of the network. So in fact, the uh, radio network controller RNC is called a cloud RNC. Similarly, it's a cloud core rather than just by itself. That gives tremendous facilities, uh, tremendous versatility. Um, there's a concept called network slicing, which allows you through the cloud to create various types of applications based on your quality of service requirements. So the fundamental shift here in the 5G was firstly the type of traffic it started uh, handling, uh, and also um, the, the type of versatility in terms of software management of the network, including the radio network controller and the, uh, and the core part of it. Um, so that was a shift in terms of 5G, and that's where uh, you know, today's discussion would be focused on. Are there any questions or clarifications? No? All right. Why is that so important? As you go into the IoT domain, the number of devices, and the devices range all the way from applications of smart health, you know, remote robotics control, um, smart city, uh, smart transportation. Driverless car is a major example of that. Um, smart agriculture, where you have all kinds of sensors being used as a way to measure the humidity and whatnot and be able to control the irrigation. So there are mind-boggling examples um, involved in IoT, and as it becomes uh, augmented with artificial intelligence, uh, uh, metadata analysis, and so on, uh, it will be the, you know, the uh, foray into the completely new intelligent applications of the future. So by 2025, um, it's, it's um, uh, estimated there will be close to 80 billion devices uh, in connection, uh, whereas for, uh, uh, for a population of about 8 billion, so that's roughly 10 billion devices, uh, I'm sorry, eight, uh, 10 devices per person. Not that each person will have 10 devices, but the overall average is going to be about 10 devices per person. 
A lot of that you already might have seen in many of the applications. Anytime you have, uh, you know, um, public safety uh, uh, applications, they already started using that. Um, there is a uh, uh, simple examples in South Korea. They have an old people's home, yeah, for people like me, you know, where uh, they want to monitor the people uh, in the home, and then. Uh, uh, as you may know that when we walk, the gait, you know, we're walking uh, is just like our fingerprints and the eye iris is unique to each one of us. So in fact, they have sensors in the uh, uh, floor, uh, intelligent floor, which can identify a person when the person walks on it. Right? It's like very, very, very interesting. So when in the old people's home, if somebody uh, falls down, the, uh, the uh, floor automatically um, uh, detects that and sends an emergency call automatically. The person, the, the um, uh, you know, emergency people come, the ambulance comes, and et cetera, et cetera. So those are some of the starting examples that are happening in Hong Kong in many areas. Uh, uh, when they walk through uh, the turnstile of the uh, railway stations and all, uh, there's nothing like uh, punching your card or buying a ticket. Uh, the system automatically uh, detects you, knows where you went into the station when you come out, knows where you came out. You go to the shop, you just pick up the stuff uh, and, uh, and walk out. And everything is done through the Internet of Things kind of approach. So it's a tremendously, tremendously explosive growth in terms of uh, Internet of Things uh, items. Okay, so this summarizes then the primary issue in terms of how uh, the 5G operation needs to be handled. Uh, on the left-hand side is the you know, range up to 6 gigahertz, uh, you know, the TV white space below the 1 gigahertz, you know, in the range of 600, 700 megahertz, uh, which is tremendously strong prime uh, frequency range in which cellular systems want to work. They give you much higher range, uh, much better performance, and so on and so forth. So those are the macro cells. So if you look at the left-hand side, that's basically you can identify as pretty well Wi-Fi, uh, WiMAX, um, cellulars up to 4G. All the systems operate up to uh, 6 gigahertz, the sub-6 gigahertz range. Um, then when you go higher and higher frequency, clearly the, uh, the uh, uh, as you know, the resonance related to the bandwidth determines the size of an antenna. So as you go to higher and higher frequency, the size of the antennas becomes smaller and smaller. So 5G, which is the operation in the higher frequency range, 30 to about 100 gigahertz, um, would have um, the, the coverage um, for a very small range. In fact, maybe one kilometer or so per cell. And we will see how we are going to mitigate that. Um, the millimeter wave, in fact, is not an unknown area for operation, and that, of course, also may create some conflict with the 5G operations. One is that each time we go through the, uh, through the airport with that scanner, right, that scanner operates in the millimeter wave. A lot of the satellite communication is also in the millimeter wave. Now, the scanners are sort of local, uh, extremely low, uh, you know, uh, power, uh, and we will see how that will or will not affect our uh, health. Uh, and then satellite, of course, is that issue is being worked in terms of what specific bands will be provided by 5G, uh, by, by FCC for 5G, so that it doesn't interfere with the satellite communication. All, all the weather forecasts and all that is dependent upon millimeter wave. So those are the primary um, applications in the millimeter wave region as far as uh, new um, propagation requirements are concerned. Um, so new mobility spectrum, the main uh, takeaway here is that it will be in the 30 to 100 gigahertz uh, range for 5G. Yeah, question? Full screen? Go to the view. Yeah, right here. Oh, yeah, okay. Thank you. Or maybe. Yeah, that will help. That should help. Full screen. Thank you. Thank you. Should I repeat all my lecture all over again? No. no. All right. I'm glad you said no. no. All right. So, um, are there any questions on this? All right. So, the whole mindset now is we are going to operate in the 5G. Now, in addition, let me also clarify that it is not that that's the differentiating value for 5G. 5G can clearly operate on any of the lower frequencies, 
Except, and in addition, in fact, the performance attributes of 5G, which is voice data also in, in video, as you see current applications, is in the range of 10 to, in some cases, 100 times the performance of 4G as a baseline. In other words, what was achieved in terms of performance from first generation to the fourth generation is being defined for one generation shift from 4G to 5G. So that's a mind-boggling rate. But most of the standard applications are not crying for bandwidth as much, right? So if you, have, if you download a movie and you get it in maybe 30 seconds, the fact that you get it in maybe three to four seconds may not be that big a deal as far as a new technology is concerned. So it's not that it's not doing many other things in addition to the machine-to-machine -machine type of communication, but it also, its value as a technology is more in the machine type communication. Right. Okay. All right. So what are the primary issues we'll highlight today? Uh, firstly, the propagation and coverage, as is obvious, from the range that is used for the high frequency. Uh, firstly, there are path laws, and a standard coverage is less than one kilometer. So what used to be considered as, in some sense, the pico cells, remember the pico cell concept for the standard uh, cellular systems, which were, at one time, was considered to be, uh, to be uh, the competitor for Wi-Fi wi at home, uh, which never took off. Um, is in some way coming back in terms of the coverage because 5G is operating at a much higher frequency. So it's not just the uh, pico cell concept here. With full flesh power allowed, it can only go up to around one kilometer. That creates deterioration of propagation characteristics, and you might see a lot of papers which, as we do as a standard electromagnetic um, engineers, um, uh, they, they characterize the media in terms of the you know, permittivity, the dielectric constant, the magnetic constant, uh, permeability, and, uh, 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 and sigma, the uh, conductivity, and also complex value, the tensor values of uh, these properties, and so on. And there is a lot of modeling which shows that uh, we have, uh, you know, much reduced uh, um, path. And also, unlike the lower frequency, there is a uh, tremendously negative effect because of humidity and rain, uh, environment. So it's a completely different range of uh, path loss and concerns that we have because of the millimeter wave part of uh, propagation. Clearly, if it works in the lower 6G, uh, there's no difference as compared to current. All right. Then we have the susceptibility to blockage. Diffraction and all is very different at that higher frequency. So if you have non-line of sight paths, whereas earlier ones could at least straddle part of the um, Earth's surface, here is pretty well absolutely non-line of sight. The shadow effect is here is much more profound. So if you are blocked by a building or something, then a millimeter wave propagation becomes very difficult. And then through the uh, concrete, uh, reinforced concrete, concrete by itself doesn't, in some sense, reduce penetration. It's the reinforcement, right? The metal associated with it, which creates the problem. So anytime you have uh, a lot of buildings are metal only building, then if you have even examples like use of meters, uh, smart meters in your basement, uh, it becomes an issue of how 5G will penetrate into that. And there are uh, ways of handling that in terms of using hybrid networks. And so also creates coverage gaps. So much larger coverage gaps as compared to the previous generation. And environmental health is the key aspect we could spend a little bit more time. So this is just to show that in terms of attenuation, when we look at the, uh, um, and this is the uh, a published paper in terms of how the attenuation changes between zero to 5G operations, so it's the first one-fourth or one-third of the picture. Note that if you just in the presence of water wave, you have the solid black line which has a, a narrow region of tremendous attenuation in the middle, and then it's you know reasonably uh, compared to that lower, and then depending upon the rain rate, you have different attenuation. So that needs to be handled, and we'll see that, of course, clearly affects the range of operations. Any questions? All right. So what are the solutions? So the two, three key things that are being considered are, one, of course, is MIMO, the multiple input, multiple output. So when we get high frequencies, the size of the antennas correspondingly also become tiny. Right? That gives you an advantage that now you can use an array. In fact, you can use a 10 by 10 array, which fits in a much smaller area than a standard macro antenna. Right? So there's a huge advantage in terms of managing. Of course, it's very complex in terms of handling that large size arrays. So size, 
uh, small antennas, small patch antennas can create large size arrays. So MIMO, which has been a concept for quite some time, becomes tremendously important for 5G. So that's one area where there's a lot of work being done. Then we use, once you have that option, you can have both spatial as well as temporal, time, multiple streams, and that will be one of the ways by which you reinforce, reduce a bit, uh, reduce a bit, uh, um, you know, uh, bit errors and be able to pass that on. And then narrow steering beam, that concentrates the energy. Mesh networks, instead of going all the way to the base station and down, you can get a communication locally, and that's much faster, much more efficient, and all relays in between. And then uh, dense using small um, cells. So those are ones which are being considered to handle uh, some of these uh, issues. Uh, note that if you look at a, a 4G macro network, compared to the 5G, it's expected that even every lamp post, every light post would have a, an antenna, 5G antenna as a way to provide ex extensive coverage, and the size of the arrays could be 100 elements or more, 10 by 10 or more. So massive MIMO is what is defined. Here. So this is a simple picture to show that uh, you can have the beams, and not only the beams, they are steering, uh, steerable. In other words, you can go from, uh, you know, from a, a location, elevation height, and you can direct up and down and sideways and so on. And we may have driverless cars, which can be supported, and et cetera. So whereas 4G macro is got a sort of circular, comparatively coverage all around it, this becomes highly steerable beams directed towards individual um, uh, device or uh, uh, user, and they can be steered along as the person also moves or the device moves in the environment. And then, of course, the mesh network, uh, the range is one kilometer, and that's pretty standard, uh, uh, you know, uh, networks used in terms of providing device-to-device -device, uh, connections. So now we come to the crux of what the issue in terms of 5G is, which is uh, health impact. If you look at the, uh, the uh, higher frequencies on the right-hand side, uh, those are the uh, gamma rays and the X-rays and the ultraviolet rays, and you know that those are ionizing. In other words, uh, the energy in the, uh, in the um, um, uh, electromagnetic waves are able to knock an electron out of an atom, so as they go in, they can reach all the way to pretty low level, and, the, the, uh, and that's why X-rays are. X-rays, in order to see the bone picture, you've got to go into the body, otherwise, you know, what's the use? But they're very dangerous in terms of the... Uh, the, the, the amount of X-rays that you can uh, accept uh, because that can, when you knock the electrons out, it changes the cell structure and hence uh, cancer and other things can happen. So that's on the right-hand side. We're going to ignore that. Going to the left-hand side, those are called non-ionizing. In other words, the electromagnetic waves do not have the uh, energy to knock an electron out, but it can change the energy state within the atom itself. So what now you have is in the um, 0.7 to 700 mega gigahertz, that's why we are working now, it's the cellular frequencies all the way to 100 gigahertz. There, the, they, don't, they cannot penetrate the, the skin, but they do have some effect on the, on the body, and that's the, that's the research going on in terms of what happens. So basically, if you look at what the initial target is, the IoT is expected to operate in the 24 to 60 gigahertz. Even Wi-Fi and all is being designed as a way to work up to 60 gigahertz, and it's part of that millimeter wave. If you really um, model your skin in terms of this uh, electrical and, uh, you know, permittivity and the permeability characteristics, electromagnetic characteristics, um, uh, you can model that, and then you find that the, the um, frequencies, the millimeter wave frequencies are able to, up, to penetrate up only the two upper um, uh, layers of the skin, the epidermis and the dermis, do not go below that. So what happens is that the sweat, sweat glands become conductive, there's a lot of reflection, and the effect is confined to the skin, which ends up in rise in the temperature. So what happens is the body temperature goes up. So the effect is more in terms of power density rather than surface density rather than power volume density, which is what is uh, involved in the other types of harmful effects. So what is the harmful effect of that? In general, the temperature, body temperature will go up. And what IEEE has done is define a one degree centigrade temperature rise to be the max that we should be allowed. Anything higher than that is called hazardous. And when the power is defined for all these radiated power, they usually use a factor of 50 
um, as a way to give the safe um, threshold for how much uh, radiation we should be able to absorb. Any questions? All right. So what has so happened so far is that what used to be the the uh, criteria in terms of power density, uh, one milliwatt uh, one milliwatt per centimeter squared on the body, that defines the power that your uh, uh, sensors and the base stations can send. Uh, is being extended to all the millimeter range, which is sort of dangerous because currently there is inconclusive information about what level of um, problems humans would have based on this propagation. So in 2017, there was a, a letter sent out to both FCC and to the United Nations to carry out further studies. Uh, American uh, Academy of Pediatricians also has stepped in. So there are a lot of literature being done as a way to understand the impact, but uh, uh, that is an open item. Uh, what I expect is that it's not something to you'll be concerned about at the time. It may take some years. Uh, not only that, the level rather than one, it may be 0.8. It will be in the vicinity, not vicinity, not in an order of magnitude difference. So, and the, finally, the deployment issues. Uh, you see a lot of bad press for. Uh, for um, 5G, not because uh, it's bad, because it's being uh, deployed prematurely. So that is what I see. So finally, then, the, um, the uh, 1G to 4G and 5G support multimedia, but 5G is a, non, is a new paradigm, and it's a new domain of millimeter wave, and key issues are uh, health and uh, propagation. So All right. All right. All right. Thank you.